Hello, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at Daily Sand this year. My name is Fernando Zambiega. I'm a critical care physician researcher from AgeCore and the BrickNet in Brazil. And I'm going to talk a little bit about new and old statistical approach to clinical trials. So I have several conflicts of interest to declare, but I have not received any direct funding, reimbursing or consulting fees, and most of the grants were for investigator-initiated trials. So mission control here is first to discuss trial designs on the both frequentist and Bayesian frameworks without being pedantic. So that's a very important thing. So we're going to try to discuss a little bit why, and we, we know that we have new methods here, new approaches popping out, like the remap cap uh, trial on uh, corticotroids for COVID that was published a couple days uh, ago. And then we're talking a little bit about how we can improve randomization and inference procedures in clinical trials. So uh, first of all, the goal of a clinical trial is to improve patient care uh, using the most feasible and relevant endpoints, uh, including the lowest number of patients possible. So this is something to keep in mind. And why do we do why do we do clinical trials? Because once you randomize a patient uh, aiming to look at an outcome, it really it really doesn't matter. So the total effect of a, a randomized intervention on an on outcome it really doesn't really matter uh what happens in the middle so it doesn't matter if you have sepsis if you have inappropriate drug prescriptions vending trial machines or whatever once you randomize a patient the total effect of the intervention on the outcome like death uh is uh there's no need to be adjusted so we are actually controlling for it but of course the direct effect may need adjustment and this is why we uh actually adjust the primary endpoints with uh, statistical analysis in some trials but moving forward, so statistics are science and trials are founded on statistical grounds. And we have actually two schools and uh, these schools are more complementary than opposing uh, lines of thinking. So we have the frequentist methods, which, which are the methods that most people are usually introduced to. And in a nutshell, the conclusions are drawn from sampling and from frequency. So that's why frequency is right. Uh, and then you actually check whether uh, you can make inferences using new, new hypothesis testing. So, uh, for Bayesian methods, uh, it's quite the opposite. So the data is fixed and the fact in random, and you combine what are your prior beliefs with the data in the model to see what uh, is, are, is the range of effect size that are compatible with the data. So that, that's a little bit different conceptually, but of course, uh, the results will mostly converge in most scenarios. So we have this funny, this funny joke that uh, Bayesian is one who regularly expecting a horse and catching a glimpse of a donkey, strongly believes he's seen a mule. And you can also say that the frequentist is one who is expecting anything and catching a glimpse of a donkey returns to the same place several times to conclude that nothing was ever there. So you can choose whatever you want, but uh, of course you can keep that in mind that both approaches are appropriate for, for running trials. So there's no right and wrong here. So from a frequency endpoint, you establish an hypothesis, calculate sample size, consider the number of type one events you want, usually set that at 0.05, then you set the power, then you run the trial, and you, you shouldn't peak, or at least you shouldn't make decisions while running the trial. If you do, you have to penalize yourself for doing that because the p-values only make sense for the trial that has finished, while the power is a concept that makes sense before the trial begins. Sometimes you can adapt sample size, for example, this is something that's quite new, not new, but uh, sometimes if you peak, you can see uh, trends and then you can readapt and recalculate sample size and then analyze results which are done under a frequentist, uh, uh, under a no hypothesis test, so that is the no hypothesis is true and you can, uh, you can try to deny it, but you can never affirm it. So this is just simulation to see, uh, of course, uh, you shouldn't report that for a trial, but uh, let's say I, I'm going to do a large trial of 2,200 uh, patients uh, to reduce a uh, primary endpoint from 50 to 45 percent, and then I start running the trial, and you can see the p-values, how they fluctuate over time, and how the confidence intervals and the point estimates for an intervention they 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 try they stabilize until the end of the trial. Of course, you should not peak, and if you have a look, for example, very early, for example, you can see uh, an absolutely a, a, the opposite effect so this is oh, the intervention is harmful for example uh but this is why th this says that uh you should not make decisions without penalizing yourself under a frequencies uh endpoint or a frequencies framework 
Uh, of course, I can re-simulate the trial again, and then I can get a negative result for the trial all the time. So, uh, and that's why the concept of power should be important because uh, you have a you have a given chance to actually see the difference. But if you run the same old simulation several times, you may only find a difference in, let's say, eighty percent, uh, like I I said for for this. Under the Bayesian framework, things are a little bit different. So, establish an hypothesis, you calculate a sample size. You have to establish priors for the events or the effect size. So you have to plug in uh, some prior information, and then you can run the trial. And of course, this is uh, you can debate that, but probably there is not much of a problem if you peek inside the data. So the remap cap, for example, they had monthly for for their report on COVID nineteen, they had monthly uh, peek to the data to check what was the effect size over time. Uh, and that allows you not only to adapt sample size, but to ad adapt randomization, more on that later, uh, but to stop the trial once you have some uh, degree of certainty or once you can uh, have a certain degree of certainty on fertility. And then you analyze the results and then you can plot what are the possible effect size that are compatible with the data given the priors in the model. So of course the priors are the most tender points. Sometimes people, uh, Kind of freak out for for setting the priors, uh, but mostly uh, they should be designed in the design phase of the RCT. You can consider several of things for priors, uh, but most of the time priors can only be used to regularize uh, what you are expecting. So they are just used to uh, avoid a model to to make the model skeptical for very large or very low effect size. So they are just regularizing what you're going to show. So I'm going to use the same trial as before under the Bayesian framework, for example. So uh, my prior is that the control group will have a mortality around 50% and 95% probability that the mortality is between 40 and 60. So this is the beta binomial curve for that in black. And I believe that my intervention will follow, uh, will have a 45% mortality with a 95% uh, credible interval of 35 to 55. So these are my priors. So this is equal to say that my prior is that odds ratio is 0 0.82 with this credible intervals. But of course, I use a beta here. You can do that in many ways. And then you just get the, the Bayesian updating running, and you can plug in trial data. And as patients are being admitted, so the priors here are in dashed lines. Uh, as patients are being admitted, you can see that the posterior here, which are the solid lines, they start to pick up because you are accumulating more data. So you are actually improving how your, your estimates of outcomes. So you said that the priors remain constant, of course, and then the peaks are going up as you add more patients. And after only 800 patients, we already had, uh, by this analysis, a, a probability that the absolute risk reduction was uh, lower than, than zero days, so that the intervention reduced the mortality of over 91%. So of course, when to stop the trial, we can set up the rules uh, in the beginning. For example, remap caps set to the rules to stop once you were 99% sure. But of course, you can use whatever rule you want, uh, given that you have properly explained why. Uh, of course, this, uh, this, this resulting betas here, they are, uh, they are, you can represent it with any measurement you want. So this, the relative risk, for example, in this trial was uh, 0 0.88 with a 95% credible interval for 82 versus 95%. So you can report it whatever you want. And you can report uh, slices of this. So you can report what's the probability that intervention is associated with a relative risk lower than 0.6 or higher than 1.1. Than 1 .1. So you can actually query the, the posterior any way you want. So, and one thing that is interesting that even after the bad run that I have shown before, uh the the Bayesian methods they show that you still have a 90 percent probability of benefit after the full run in that bad run that was not positive for due to chance so this kind of avoids you of throwing out the baby of the bathtub so uh, this allows you to say well uh, this may not be conclusive but of course i would be willing to keep studying this because there's a very high chance that this may be useful so of course, uh, this comes to other questions like, uh, but how to make the process of including patients in the trial uh, more appropriate and how to reduce your randomization costs because you know information is acquired during the trial. 
so how can you do that? So of course, one way is always to engage in collaborative trials, choosing proper endpoints. And one thing is you can adapt randomization and you can perform sequential trials and borrow information. Of course, this can be done in both frequentist and Bayesian frameworks. Maybe it's easier to do under Bayesian frameworks, but it can be done under both frameworks. This is a lovely review by Palman in the BMC Medicine a couple of years ago, uh, showing several ways you can adapt the trial or you can change trial conduction to improve uh, reporting and to making trial more ethical. So for example, uh, this trial here, uh, you, you, can, you can adapt, you can change the number of patients that are going to be included uh, in the groups as the trial goes and as you acquire more knowledge on what's happening. So you can do that for dropping an arm, for example, in a trial. And of course, this guarantees that you are probably enrolling patients to the group that's most promising. So this is more ethical for in a broad sense. And this type of approach, although they are kind of new, they are around. So you can find papers that have done it before. So this is a very nice trial on uh, anticonvulsant drugs for such epilepticals. And they actually, I'm not going to go all through this, but they actually, the, the, the core of the analysis was an update of the beta binomial distribution, a similarly, uh, of course, a little bit more complex, but uh, similarly to what I've shown before. So uh, it, it's simpler than it sounds for most of the time. Uh, we have some adaptive trials going on. So for example, one, one good example of how to, to use uh, all this information in an adaptive framework is a trial on antivirals for, for COVID-19. So you can set up a first stage trial where you, you check viral load, for example, and then you move on to a viral load outcome, and then you move on to a clinical endpoint, and you can borrow and you can use information for all uh, the, the groups uh, until the outcome. So this is a way to improve, uh, to use your sample size better. So in conclusion, clinical trials are absolutely necessary. There is no statistical approach that's better or worse. Some might be more flexible, some less. Uh, perhaps Bayesian methods may excel in adaptive trials, but of course you can run anything that you can run in a frequentist framework, in a Bayesian framework, and vice versa. And we all should remember to reappraise the evidence as it goes. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. See you next time.